Good happy Wednesday morning, May 13, 2020. I'm Riley King and welcome to this Wednesday morning edition of the Riley King Newscast right here on the Riley King Network. We have a lot of news to get to this Wednesday morning, so let's begin. First step, nine additional COVID-19 related deaths announced in New Hampshire. 81 new cases, one new hospitalization. Let's take a listen to that video from WMUR News 9. As we all hunker down in these tough times, there's still work to be done. And Mahindra. Right now, new numbers on COVID-19 here in the Granite State showing that the virus is still hitting seniors hard. Good evening. I'm Mike Cherry. And I'm Monica Hernandez. There are nine new deaths to report tonight, all people 60 or older. Total deaths have now reached 142. There are also 81 new cases, including five in patients under the age of 18. Total cases confirmed in New Hampshire so far, now 3,239. More than 1,200 people have recovered. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Coronavirus in New Hampshire. Key information. Let's take a look right now. And here's that COVID-19 in New Hampshire key information. There are 3,239 number of people in New Hampshire have tested positive for COVID-19. 1,408,73 number of people in the United States who have tested positive. 142 number of deaths from COVID-19 in New Hampshire. 319 number of people who have been hospitalized with COVID-19 in New Hampshire. And 83,368 number of deaths from COVID-19 in the United States. This map of New Hampshire shows you where cases of COVID-19 are. These are current cases of COVID-19. In Nashua, 170. And these are total cases of COVID-19 in New Hampshire and towns and cities. Nashua, 301. Now let's take a look at this chart. Let's start with new cases each day in New Hampshire. In the purple, daily new positive COVID-19 cases. In the orange, new hospitalizations. And in the red, deaths. This chart here. Current cases in the purple, total current COVID-19 cases, and in the orange, current hospitalizations. In this chart here, total cases in the purple, total positive COVID-19 cases, in the orange, total hospitalizations, in the red, deaths, and in the blue, recovered. And now this chart here shows you by age group. This chart here shows you by female and male. And this chart here shows you risk information. This chart here shows you race slash ethnicity of cases. And this chart here shows you percent of New Hampshire population. And again, your common symptoms, fever, lack of smell, cough, chills, and difficult breathing. How it spreads and prevention tips. And be sure to stay with the Riley King Network for the latest of your COVID-19 information. Asking questions, Fauci, on best ways to keep nursing homes safe. Infection disease expert warns about consequences of reopening too early. Let's take a listen to that video from WMUR News 9, Tyler Dumont. As
As New Hampshire joins more than two dozen states that have begun to relax restrictions to reopen, the nation's top infectious disease expert warned of, quote, really serious consequences if stay-at-home orders are lifted too quickly. My concern is that we will start to see little spikes that might turn into outbreaks, but could even set you back on the road to try to get economic recovery, because it would almost turn the clock back rather than going forward. Dr. Anthony Fauci, partially quarantining at home after possible virus exposure, answered questions from a Senate committee about the nation's response to COVID-19. Among the members, New Hampshire Senator Maggie Hassan, who asked about nursing homes. How frequently do we need to test patients and staff on a continuing basis, and what other measures will be necessary to keep our loved ones in these facilities safe? General testing for all, I think, is a good start. But when you look where you're going to go, in the future, there has to be a considerable degree of surveillance capability. The senator also asked Fauci if nursing homes should follow similar protocols recently implemented at the White House, where some staffers are now being tested daily. Fauci responded that such a large-scale measure may not be practical. But very strict uh, regulations and guidelines about who is allowed to go into the nursing home and the staff, I believe, needs to be monitored very carefully with intermittent testing. The senator also asked about vaccine production and if the urgency of COVID-19 could have a negative impact on other prevention efforts against things like the flu and the measles. Dr. Fauci didn't elaborate on availability but said it could be an unintended consequence. Reporting live, Tyler Dumont, WMUR News 9. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Governor Baker asked lawmakers to authorize $1 billion in COVID-19 spending. Feds will reimburse state, Baker says. Let's take a listen to that video from WCVB Boston. state will slowly begin to reopen starting on Monday, but the feds and the state both say we need to be cautious. So we're not out of the woods yet. From the feds to the state. We're not yet out of the woods. The same warning against reopening prematurely. 45 states have scaled back restrictions, many ignoring White House guidelines, reopening before a 14-day decline in cases. My concern is that we will start to see little spikes that might turn into outbreaks. Here in Mass, a cautious four-phase approach to reopening starts on Monday. Governor Baker hinting the first phase will likely put already open essential businesses under new guidelines. The downside to that, and it's an important downside, is you want to do this in a way where you can sustain the opening. The hand sanitizer bottles. The governor toured Matt Tech Life Sciences, now making sanitizer and test kits. Authorities say the road to reopening leads through testing. And the curve looks flat with some slight coming down. So I think we're going in the right direction. But the right direction does not mean we have by any means total control of this outbreak. More than 80,000 Americans have died from COVID-19. Dr. Fauci thinks that number is even higher, and he does not expect a vaccine before school starts in the fall. We don't know everything about this virus, and we really better be very careful, particularly when it comes to children. Now, the governor did not say if the stay-at-home advisory will be extended. It also remains unclear exactly which businesses may reopen on Monday. Live in Boston, Sean Chai, about WCVB News Center 5. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Portland proposes street closures as part of plan to help restaurants and retailers reopen. 
Let's take a listen to that video from WMTW News 8 Maine. Giving the class of 2020 recognition they deserve. Channel 8 Senior Shoutouts. Since switching to takeout two months ago, Karen Dowdy, owner of Anthony's Family Kitchen, estimates she's seen a 70% decline in business. After 28 years of doing this, you know, my dad starting this up and us being in this family business together, it's been an enormous shift. But a plan put forward by city leaders in Portland might help by allowing her and other business owners to claim once coveted sidewalk space. To be able to sit outside and, you know, overlook Middle Street, I mean, why not? If approved, six downtown streets would be temporarily closed to traffic beginning June 1st, so businesses can take over sidewalks, parking lots, and more. City of Portland spokesperson Jessica Grondon says the plan could allow businesses to serve customers at full capacity. Obviously, with the social distancing, um, you know, guidance that they have to follow in terms of spacing people out, a lot of them wouldn't be able to do that with just their inside space. The plan is slated to go before the city's Economic Development Committee Thursday. Dowdy says the plan, pitched during a particularly dark time for her business, offers a glimmer of hope. It's very encouraging, and, and we just stay rooted, man, in the faith that we put a lot of years into this, not ready to walk away, just not. That plan is expected to go before the full Portland City Council on Monday. If it is approved, those road closures could remain in place all the way through November. Reporting live in Portland, Terry Stackhouse, WMTW News 8. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Vermont homeless individual relocated out of North Beach campers. Some homeless individuals moved to motels told to leave campers put up because of COVID-19. Let's take a listen to that video from NBC5 Vermont. Hi, I'm Brad Nelson from Brown Furniture. The past couple of months have been tough on everyone. Campers here on North Beach are being cleaned out. They've been parked here since March 26, providing shelter for roughly 25 homeless people during the pandemic. It helped with social distancing and preventing a potential outbreak. North Beach Campground was a really great example of a nonprofit agency and the city and state working together on a project. Kevin Pounds directs a new place, the nonprofit that managed the campers. The state leased and paid for the campers. Most of those who stayed in them have been moved to motels, so the campers will be packed up and moved out too. We're presently working with the city to kind of reopen a portion of North Beach Campground on June 1st. That'll be, uh, for lack of a better word, a sanctioned, organized tenting area. These areas will likely provide showers, bathrooms, and support for people without housing. I well, intend that the community is very committed to are protecting the most vulnerable and really ensuring that in this pandemic, uh, we aren't leaving um, people behind. Mayor Moreau Weinberger discussed this in a virtual town hall Tuesday with two doctors, one of them from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, Dr. Sharfstein. He says the virus may have spread without the campers. You also can see that in shelters for people who are experiencing homelessness, particularly when people are older or have chronic illnesses. The mayor bringing in experts virtually to get information they need to make moves to open up more of the city. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Some restaurants call new outdoor dining rules impractical. Let's take a listen to that video from NBC 10, Rhode Island. It's 
Nuts, not practical. New on the night team, those are words from some restaurant owners tonight who have concerns about the governor's new dining restrictions. Because starting Monday, restaurants can offer limited outdoor dining. Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Janik. Good evening. I'm Patrice Wood. But some restaurants are telling us that allowing customers inside is the only way their businesses can survive. The night team's Danielle Kennedy live in Warwick to explain. Danielle? Hi, Patrice and Dan. The owner of Brood Awakenings tells me that even though he has some outdoor seating, he's not going to open it next Monday for the public, calling the governor's new rules and restrictions impractical. By having these restrictions that are so tight, the only thing you can do is put these guys out of business. David Levesque is saying no thanks to limited reservation only outdoor dining at his five Brood Awakenings locations. Nobody's calling Brood Awakenings saying, hey, I want to make a reservation to have a coffee. He says offering a max of 20 socially distant tables will cost more than it's worth. You need to allow inside seating as much as you do outside seating. But the governor says it's too soon. We're doing the best we can. If we relax these guidelines, too much too quickly it's going to be worse for them because then it'll take even longer to get back up and running outdoor only tables also concerning for large restaurants like cellos who's still considering opening its waterfront seating in warwick high winds rain whatever it may come our way it could present some challenges if there's nothing set in place for that to allow for folks to come indoors. And I think we can do so safely at a reduced capacity. Some just wanting a seat at the table. We really like to make ourselves available at a local level here in Rhode Island with the state and the local municipalities to work together on some more tailored reopening plans. I think you need to have guidelines and I think you need to leave it up to the restaurant tours to be able to police those as well as we know how and should. The governor has said that she hopes to allow some indoor dining starting in phase two. Live tonight in Warwick, I'm Danielle Kennedy, NBC 10 News and 18. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. St. Francis take down field COVID-19 hospitals. Let's take a listen to that video from Eyewitness News 3. Welcome back, everybody, at 530. Here's some good news. In fact, a good sign that the state is making progress in the fight against the coronavirus. The mobile field hospital at St. Francis Hospital in Hartford was actually taken down today. The 25-bed facility was set up back in March as part of that hospital's emergency preparedness plan. Uh, the mobile unit was built to help with a, a possible surge in patients. In my line of work, you want to be over-prepared, and, and, but of course hope for the best, and that's exactly what happened uh, here. We never needed to use the tent, but it was really nice to have it just in case. And, uh, you know, it's an opportunity to thank the public for all you've all done to uh, prevent the surge of peak we could have had. And that is surely some good news. If there is a second surge, though, this summer or maybe in the fall, a hospital staff, they say the mobile field hospital can be set up again in as little as 48 hours. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Good news there. That they didn't need it. Here's it. Stock features. Little change following losses from the previous session. U.S. stock features were little changed in overnight trading and pointed to losses at the open on Wednesday after a sharp sell-off in the previous session. Police target employee breaks arm in fight with shopper who wouldn't wear a mask. Two men 
who allegedly refused to wear masks inside a Target store in California are facing Fennelly battery charges after a fight that left an employee security guard with a broken arm, according to the Los Angeles Police Department. The suspect were not wearing face coverings when they entered the store at Van News location on May 1st and were confronted by store employees, police said. They were being escorted out of the store when the fight broke out, police said in a statement released on Monday. As they approached the exit, one suspect suddenly, without provocation, turned and punched a store employee, according to the police statement. Security video of the incident appeared to show another employee then grab the suspect and both of them falling to the floor. A third employee grabbed the other man and they also fell on the ground. One of the guards broke his left arm in the fight. The Los Angeles Fire Department paramedics took him to the hospital for treatment police said. The two suspects identified by police as 31-year-old Philip Hamilton and 29-year-old Paul Hamilton were arrested later that day. CNN has not been able to determine whether the men have attorneys. They were released from jail with 50,000 bail police. Said. In a statement, Target said it was grateful for its support of local police and said it would cooperate with the investigation. The safety and security of our guests and team members is our top priority, the company said. The incident came about two weeks after Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcia issued an emergency order requiring all customers to wear masks in grocery stores and other essential businesses. And that is it for this morning edition of the Riley King Newscast right here on the Riley King Network. And thank you for watching. Have a great rest of your day. And I'll see you back here later on today for another newscast. I'll have a news report coming up in a little bit. Goodbye, everyone.